type. This paper is on Dory, efficient, transparent algorithms for generalized in the products and polynomial commands. I'm Jonathan Lee, the VP of R&D at Nanotronics, uh, but most of this work happened whilst I was a senior researcher at Microsoft Research in Redmond. So what's an efficient, transparent algorithm? Well, an argument some protocol between a prover P and a verifier V about some NP language L. And the cool notion here is that the prover has some, uh, there's some public uh, instance X and L, and the prover has some witness W for that instance. And the prover wants to show the verifier that they know that witness, possibly without revealing anything about it. The verifier ultimately is going to accept this proof if and only if the prover does have such a witness, modulo some negligible uh, error probabilities or the prover being able to break some computational assumption. So what do we mean by efficiency? Well, for our purposes, that means that setup and proving are both going to be linear in the size of the witness, and the verification and proof size are both going to be logarithmic in size of the witness. Um, in applications, you can think of the witness sizes here being maybe 2 to 20, 2 to 30. So you really don't want to find yourself doing something quadratic, for example, in the size of the witness. And you know, it's certainly convenient for the uh, verifier if all the operations they have to do are very small. The other thing we need is transparency. So again, transparency means that you know, if there's any setup plays to this argument, that can be uh, anything from selecting fields, selecting some groups, um, choosing a hashing algorithm, whatever it might be, uh, that that can be done uh, without embedding any secrets. So for example, it would be uh, troubling if there was some particular element that you needed to know the log of in order to compute the secret, uh, to compute the setup, but if you need the logarithm of that element that you could uh, break in the task. So, and the other question is, like, what's a generalized inner product and what's a polynomial command? Well, for that, we're gonna to have to fix some field scales F and we're gonna introduce some uh, parent friendly curve. So we've got two, two curves, G1, G2, they're not isogenous, uh, and some map G1 cross G2 to G2. Um, so in this context, a generalized inner product argument uh, is really about three vector spaces, U, V, W, and some, some inner product U cross V to W. So in the simplest case, you could think of U and V both being vectors in F, uh, and W just being scale of the mesh. Uh, but you could also take you know, U or V individually to be uh, one of the two source groups, in which case you might have something from um, you know, something like a multi exponentiation, would be a bilinear map from uh, a vector of scalars in F and a vector of elements in G1 to a scale to a single element of G1. Um, or you could even take U and V to be vectors of elements of G1 and G2, respectively, and W could be an element of G2. The key point is, however you do this, you have some commitments to D1, D2, uh, so commitments to elements of UV and W, and you want to give some argument that you know some openings uh, of those commitments, um, and that if you were to take the inner product between those openings, that you would get the, uh, the results that you expect. So why would you care about a generalized inner product argument? Does that second the sort of intrinsic interest of being able to argue about it? Well, basically, you can use these things to build polynomial limits. So, for a polynomial commitment, we fix some sequence of degrees. Uh, we now have a commitment to some F, some possibly multivariate polynomial, uh, and some scalar. Uh, and then the notion is that if we fix some, some public X1 through Xn, that you can make some argument that uh, you can open a particular commitment to F and a commitment to some potential evaluation. You can prove that the that F evaluates that X is that evaluation, and in the implicit, you can check that. Uh, F has a degree sequence bounded by the DIs. Now, this differs slightly from the traditional definition of uh, a polynomial commitment in the sense of cutting, uh, because we're committing to the evaluation rather than having that be in the clip. And we're allowing the, the general argument to take place. So maybe it's uh, interactive rather than non interactive. So, why would you care about either of these things? Well, fundamentally, if you go and you look at uh, much of the existing literature for building ZK scenarios, so succinct non interactive arguments of knowledge for NP complete languages. This proceeds in a sequence of steps. So typically, the non interactivity is acquired under the HMA, you compile out some interactivism. Um, but then there's some decomposition of many of these algorithms, many of these arguments into two phases. First, there's some polylogarithmic, purely information theoretic production uh, from the full ZK snark for some generic language to specifically doing polynomial commands. So uh, this is you know, using tricks like the sum check but, and you know, other, other interesting techniques. Um, and then separately, you then have to actually evaluate these polynomials under some commitments. You might have to send some commitments from the prover to the verifier. And it's very natural to really split those two things apart. Look at the reductions, one, one thing to study individually, and the polynomial commitment is the same thing. In much of the literature, this is not done. And uh, inside those two things are bundled together, which, you know, Will make it a little challenging to compare Dory with some some with some other words. 
And so, you know, what do we what do we want of our um, colonial you know, the building efficiency for science? Well, you know, it needs to be concretely efficient, it needs to be fast. Um, it's helpful if it is transparent. Uh, that's a nice feature to have in your CKS now. And also, you know, you'll note that we have some O1 collection of polynomials that might be evaluated at some O1 collection of points. It will be convenient if it turns out that you can take that batch of polynomials and some batch of points and maybe combine the evaluations in some efficient way. So given this background, you know, schematically, you know, what are some previous works that have been in the space? So we're going to compare to three works, at least schematically. So we have uh, Hyrax, Fractal, and Supersonic. They're based on different assumptions. So Hyrax is just based on some curve with a hard d-log. So you can think of concretely curve 25519. Um, Fractal is based on B Solomon IOPs. So again, you know, you can you need a, you need a hash function, but that's it. Uh, and supersonic is based on groups of unknown order. So uh, these are a, an interesting kind of group where you somehow can't figure out their size. Um, and as you can see, you've got some, some really interesting properties. So you know, Hyrax is concretely efficient for the prover to, or Hyrax is pretty efficient for the prover to evaluate, but you know, the commitment sizes and the evaluations are a little large. Uh, for fractal, you know, across the board, things look to be pretty good, but the uh, amount of uh, communication required to do an evaluation is larger than might be liked, uh, as is the, the complexity of the prover to evaluate. Um, and for something like supersonic, it's uh, at least naively a little tricky. It looks like both the setup and the evaluation take longer than the ideal. Uh, now, these are very asymptotic comparisons. You know, really, we want to, again, understand this a little concretely. That's challenging because it is more patient dependent. But you know, if we just fix a concrete security level and we get some concrete numbers that are you know, no more significant than they, are, they, they happen to be what my laptop spit out, um, then you know, we can get some, some concrete numbers to attach to this. So, uh, Benchmarking with the fastest code I could find, um, you know, we see that something like Hyrax uh, to do an exponentiation in, in curve two five five one nine takes maybe you know, a few tens of microseconds. Uh, doing a hashing operation in of uh, sixty four bytes uh, in you know using using uh, the hash functions used in the uh, are in the libIOP implementation of Fractal takes a few tens of nanoseconds. Uh, Supersonic is a little more challenging because there isn't a concrete implementation of it, um, and there's been some. Uh, substantial dispute in the literature uh, about how large the parameters need to be for a particular concrete security level for these groups of unknown order. But taking uh, the current, as best I can tell, best estimates for how large these parameters need to be, you end up with something where you know you need a few hundred bytes for an element of GU and doing an exponentiation, raising to an exponent of you know, 128 bits, it's gonna take you a few tens of milliseconds. So, that sort of makes all of this chart a little more tricky, right? So uh, for, for Hyrex, whilst the concrete numbers are pretty good, and most of these steps are fine in practice, uh, both the size of the commitments and the verify what to do the evaluation, or to verify the evaluation proofs are a little larger than you might like. Um, for Fractal, you know, there's, uh, there are these stray logs floating around that you know, maybe would be fine if we really could say three orders of magnitude concretely. Uh, and for Supersonic, it's, it's very challenging to see how you can concretely deal with the uh, very slow operations in these groups. Now, I, I mentioned that fractal would be, or result of IOP is in general would be great if you could really get away with using these, uh, these concrete constants. Um, but there's a small asterisk on both of these, uh, which is that whilst for things like Hyrax or Supersonic, the expected soundness error of the underlying arguments is very small, you know, exponentially small. Uh, for retail and IOP is the best proved uh, soundness errors are order one. And that means that you end up having to repeat uh, the underlying arguments some large number of times. So uh, again, the uh, libIOP implementation of Fractal, if you ask it to give you 120 bits of security, it repeats this argument about 500 times. So you know, that's, that's starting to get you know, substantial. Um, it makes the, uh, the apparent fast concrete constants not really quite so fast. Now, obviously, uh, this is, this is a, a talk, so you know we've got some some table with all prior work in it, and so you know, now naturally we introduce what does this work do. Um, so unlike the previous works, this is uh, already requires a parent parameter. So concretely, all these numbers are going to be about uh, the BLS twelve three eighty one implementation given the blasters. Um, so that's uh, yeah, that's what we get. Uh, you'll note that. Uh, we get some uh, linear time to commit, we get logarithmic evaluation, uh, and both the time taken to do the actual approval work to 
you know, to prove the evaluation or to do the setup are both square root n, which is quite nice. Um, this uh, 192 bytes to get a uh, serialized GT is a, a little challenging. You need to go and do, you, you need to use a few tricks in order to serialize elements of GT that efficiently, but that's, again, prior work. Um, so what is, right? well, fundamentally, it's a new generalized inner product document. And so once you compile it down, you get a new column and open it scheme as well. Uh, conceptually, it is most similar to bulletproofs uh, or the generalized IPA of uh, BMN TV19. Um, and, you know, it's easiest to really present this from the linear polynomials. That's not a fundamental restriction. The paper goes into the details of how you can handle arbitrary polynomial degree sequences. So, as I said, we need a curve with a pair. Um, and the security assumption we're going to use is SXDH. So what does that mean? It means Diffie-Hellman in both source groups. Uh, and it means this uh, C-code DH is hard between G1 and G2. So if you give me, essentially, uh, a scalar specified as the ratio of the logarithms of two elements in one group, and you give me an element from the second, I can't find uh, that second element, that element from the second group uh, raised to a raised to that scale. Um, so, you know, at some very crude level, like, what are we actually going to do inside Dory? Why, why is Dory in advance? Why couldn't you have done Dory five years ago? Well, so the, the key, key idea here is that we have the ability to take structure preserving commands. And when we, you know, in a setup, we sample some polynomial n, square root n uh, elements. And we're going to compute a logarithmic number of structure preserving commands to us. Um, and those are actually the only things that verifiers are ever going to use going forward. So they have this logarithmic collection of somehow um, structured commitments to some structured data. Um, and the verifier is going to use those in an interesting way. So basically, these are uh, not just um, like when we've done the sampling, we've sampled some generators for some, some other commitment schemes, and we've then somehow generated commitments to those commitments. Um, the, the reason why we do that is so the verifier can offload a bunch of computations they would otherwise have to do themselves to the prover. So in a bulletproof type scheme, you generate some challenges, and then at the end, the verifier normally has to do a linear time computation. Instead, we're going to offload that to the prover. Um, and if you do this in a naive way, you get uh, some extra some extra plane introduced in every brand of bulletproof like folding. Uh, so naive you would have with some like log squared arguments. Uh, instead, we, you know, in some sense, do the natural thing. We hold these things together to keep the number of claims constant, and that's how we get to a logarithmic verifier. So now let's go through that in you know, a little more detail. To do that, we need to actually introduce some, some preliminaries first. So first, first things first, we're not going to worry about hiding. If you want to see how we do that, just go into the paper. But fundamentally, you know, we're just going to, to get hiding. Um, you just add random multiples of, of your favorite base point to everything. Uh, and then you need to do some like, very small number of sigma groups at the end just to prove that you could open things correctly. Um, as a standard, we're going to start with some public coin, just verify statistical ZK arguments, and you can compile those to ZK snark version there. Now, not all standards are actually important. Uh, the way we're going to get that thread is that we're going to extend the emulation. So this is, uh, again, for people who've seen bulletproofs, this is very much how it's done um, across the board. So the notion here is that we have some polynomially large tree, uh, where each of the paths through this tree is labeled essentially with a transcript, or a potential transcript, uh, of an argument that ends up convincing the verifier. Um, and when the, you know, if you're given such a large tree, then you can somehow mechanically go through and extract the, uh, the witness. Now, this is quite convenient because if you have witness extended emulation for a whole sequence of arguments and you chain them one after another, then it's very easy to combine those and say, well, if each of my individual rounds had witness extended emulation, then the whole thing does. Um, and I mean, how are we going to get this? Well, um, the key thing which we do again and again in, in all the proofs um, is that we have some bounded degree Laurent polynomials in one or two variables. Uh, and from looking at some small tree of exception transcripts, we're able to argue that uh, some polynomial of this point is zero for a large number of places. And then in a completely unconditional way, if it's zero in a large number of distinct places, then it has to be zero uniformly. Um, and this allows you to then essentially take some interpolation, extract the uh, underlying coefficients of this polynomial and use that to, to build um, witnesses one stage further along. So, you know, having having sort of mentioned all these things as preliminaries, like why can something like Dory work in the first place? So, you know, what's our commitment scheme? It's going to be basically a Peterson commitment or um, the generalization of Peterson commitments to working in a bilinear setting, which is the uh, AFGHO, which is done by AFGHO, so Arbe et al. Uh, so, what does that look like? Well, you know, you pick some uh, 
uh, some generator scanner and some some H. Uh, and if you want to commit some some vector V, then you take the inner product of V with the gammas and you add some random multiple of H. Um, for you know, written like this, this is just a Peterson commitment. Uh, if you substitute things incorrectly, you can also get other commitments out, uh, you know, picking different, um, essentially different modules for where you're taking gamma and these from. So one interesting thing about both these commitments is their structure preserving. So that means that, you know, if I have a commitment to a vector, or if I have two commitments to two vectors, I uh, multiply them by scalars, I can add them up. Right? So I have uh, F linear operations on my underlying uh, modules. And Particularly important for Abe et al. in particular um, is that there is a symmetry between the kind of thing that you're committing and the kind of thing that is used to generate that commit. So um, a uh, set of generators that you use for a commitment to a vector of G1 elements is a vector of G2 elements and vice versa. Um, and uh, that commitment is very small, it's order one. So what we can do and what we do do pretty routinely um, is that we find that we have some verified computation that needs to be done using the public generators for some commitment uh, and some other public data. And instead of actually having to verify do that, which you know the, the, the generators might be quite large, instead of doing that, the uh, verifier and the provers have already computed some commitment to those generators with respect to a second set of generators. And we're going to offload the entire computation onto the prover. The prover is going to come and give us some auxiliary argument that tells us that if we were to have done this particular operation on this public data, then we would have got the right answer. Um, this, this can be quite convenient for us because the commitment is small, uh, the, uh, all the data is public, the prover can actually just, you know, in principle at least, do this. Um, you can sort of see this as being uh, kind of like computational commitments if you've read the uh, Spartan paper on, uh, which was one of the first papers to really sort of cleanly did give this delineation into a information theoretic part in a computational polynomial. So let's dig into the previous level just so we can have some sense for what we're doing and how it works. So this is certainly like how I would present all proofs if, if I had to. The, the notion here is that you really look at uh, folding an inner product into an inner product of half the length. So on the right, you see we have two vectors AB, we have their inner products, we have some, some extra stuff some like alphas and alpha inverses multiplied by some seemingly arbitrary things. And on the left, we have some like shorter inner products. So here, the notion is that AL and AR are the left and right halves of a vector. BL and BR are also the left and right halves of a vector B. And if you just take this thing on the left and multiply it out, you find that you get you know, alpha times alpha inverse, AL, BL, and just AR, BR, that, that's up to AB. So why is that useful for us? Well, it means that if we have uh, some claim that we know what the inner product of A and B is, then the prover can actually send these nominal alpha and alpha inverse terms. The prover is ultimately going to have to compute ARBL and ALBR. Um, and then the verifier can sample alpha. Right? They can now uh, you know, evaluate uh, this right hand side, given the claim about what AB is and these claims about ARBL and ALBR, and they end up with some claim about some inner product of half length factors. Uh, and if you sort of inspect this, there are no commitments here, but if you just sort of think about, uh, you know, given this, these factors A prime, B prime for a variety of alpha and uh, values of alpha, uh, you can interpolate and extract out what AL and uh, AL, AR, BL, BR must have been, and therefore construct the uh, You know, sound you check that you know, the inner products are what you expect them to be. So why is this cool? Well, you know, if you started with some factor of length two to the M, you could run this argument M times with some challenges, uh, and you would ultimately end up with some claim about two length one vectors, scalars, um, and some you know claim for their what their inner product is, and that you can prove with a standard sort of second proof. Um, and when you sort of look at this, you know, you end up finding that there are these these two vectors um, of, of scalars. Uh, which have been got by uh, taking the chronicle products of a whole bunch of short vectors, you know, A11, A21, and A1 inverse 1, A2 inverse 1. Um, and like the final claim that you'll end up having is that the final product, Y fin, uh, is this, this bizarre product of an inner product of, uh, of X plus with A and X minus with B. Now, why this, you know, th this is. Yeah, so far so, so irritating. Like this is this is not really uh, working with commitments or anything else. So suppose you wanted to you know somehow take this kind of argument, such as it is, and turn it into something that works with committing factors. Well, uh, you would pick some generators, gamma one and gamma two, for commitments to uh, 
factor B1, B2, and the proof would be claiming to know these factors. And following the same kind of folding procedure and just keeping track of, of what you know, um, you would end up reducing to some claim that the proven knows two particular elements, B1 prime, B2 prime, such that the product is one particular thing, and the product of B1 with X minus in a product with gamma two is something, and X plus in a product with gamma one multiplied by B2 is something else. So these are sort of like the commitments that you have to evaluate at the end. And then, you know, finally, what would the prover do? Again, if you don't care about zero knowledge or hiding, you know, the proof could just send you B1 prime, B2 prime. Uh, and the verifier has to then go and check these, uh, these inner products of these public factors of X with these public factors, gamma one, gamma two. Now, naively, this is still order N for the, for the verifier, which is a little troubling. Um, you know, in the context of polynomials, there are some tricks you can use to really split the, um, split the polynomial evaluation into a, into a matrix product. And this is what Hyrex does. Uh, this basically means you only need to do some sort of square root N work. And, but you do actually have to send some sort of square root number commitments all the around. So, you know, let's, let's sort of like dig into this a little bit further. You know, we have something here, which is, is logarithmic, but for the fact that right at the end, the verifier has to do this apparently linear time computation uh, between some public vector of scalars and some public vector of, of generators. So, you know, how could we try and offload this? Well, we go back to thinking about what the, what the structure of these uh, scalars are. So we have this vector of scalars x plus, say, uh, and that's been constructed as a chronic product like this. And so, you know, if we split gamma one into a left part and right part, then what you'll end up finding is that this inner product of s plus, x plus with gamma one is some uh, inner product of a slightly shorter vector, x, x uh, plus prime, say, it's the product from uh, a21 up to am1, um, with this alternate vector on the right, like um, alpha one gamma one alpha one gamma one r. So this is a shorter, a, a shorter end product. Um, and you might say, well, you know, so what? Like this is, it's a slightly shorter end product, but you saw this all linear in length, um, but you can offload this to the prover. So if the verifier knew some pre-computed commitments to gamma one l and gamma one r with respect to some arbitrary other generators, then you could combine those commitments. And that would give you a commitment to this, this right hand part, this alpha one gamma one L plus gamma one R. Um, and X plus isn't yet, but you know, it turns out that uh, that's fine it, because it's being constructed as a chronic product. You only need to keep track of these logarithmic number of scales. You never know, actually have to instantiate X. Um, and it, you know, so as a corollary of that, it turns out that you can take the inner products of uh, vectors that are built up of chronic products of short vectors in, in the logarithmic time. Um, so what's this sort of telling you? It's telling you that if you tried to sort of offload this right hand inner product of x prime x plus prime uh, with alpha one gamma one l plus gamma one r uh, to the prover, that you know after some logarithmic amount of work you would be able to half the length, and then you'd have a half length generalized inner product to prove again. You could try doing it again, um, and you know to do this you need to be able to recurse, but you can recurse because commitments elements of g one are given by uh, factors in G2 and commitments to uh, factors in G2 are given by factors in G1. So if you just did this naively, you end up with some log squared proof size and verify compute, which is um, good but not great. We can go a little further than that. So you know, we can combine these things. So again, just an, an equality about inner products of vectors uh, is that if you have uh, four vectors, A, B, C, D, uh, then if you combine A and C with some beta and some B and D with the beta, then you get uh, some, you know, some nonsense. Uh, but you know, when you look at this, you see that AB shows up as uh, the beta independent term and CD shows up as the beta squared term. And then the only thing that's left is this beta term. So again, you know, you can, if, the, if the prover wants to claim that they know some ABCD with given inner products S and U, then you know, the proof can send this cross term, just some claim for it. The verifier can sample beta uniformly at random and, and uh, then require that the prover show knowledge of vectors whose inner product is s plus beta t plus beta squared u. And again, like in exactly the same way, if the prover can do this for a whole bunch of beta, then you can interpolate out uh, that they must have had these vectors and the, the, uh, the verifier can reconstruct those vectors. So this is interesting because it means that if I've got two inner products that I want to compute, uh, then there's some sort of two to one reduction. So if the prover has two claims, they can reduce them to one claim in some, some slightly clever way. And you know, if the vectors are committed, then the verifier is actually going to have some commitments here, and they're going to have to do. Right, so you're going to have to have some commitments uh, to the inner product of A and B, and maybe a commitment to C and D, and you know, just 
do this linear combination. Uh, as before, it will be fine. So, so what does this look like in practice? Well, if we take uh, what would have previously been a, an inner product between two committed axes, and we run one random bullet clips on it, so we've just done a, a simple a simple halving of the lengths, then we have some u1, which is this uh, combination from the, the generators the gamma 1, and some u2, which is a combination of the generators of gamma 2. Uh, the claim is that the verifier, uh, so that, that should be the proof. The proof is supposed to know sort of C prime, uh, so verifier knows C prime, D prime, is D prime since some S, um, such that you have these five claims. So essentially, the uh, C has been replaced by C prime because we have sort of half the length. Um, and these U1, U2 are these folded generators. So in this case, the verifier is able to compute F1 and F2 because they know uh, commitments of gamma 1L, gamma 1R, gamma 2L, gamma 2R. And uh, C prime, D1 prime, D2 prime come straight out of the bulletproof. So you've got five claims. You want to somehow reduce them. Uh, you can always just do this in the most naive way. The prover can make additional claims about the cross terms. Uh, the verifier can pre-compute uh, some of these, some of these cross terms if they're purely about public data. Um, and then that means you can combine these claims about C prime, D1 prime, D2 prime, uh, and update all the claims as appropriate. This would give you a log size proof um, and could already give you logarithmic verifier computation. The constants are horrible. They're like 20 or 30 operations per, per round. It's, it's quite bad. Um, so, you know, what is Dory? Dory is this, but like slightly finessed so that we have slightly more concrete constants. So, like very concretely, this, this will be the only slice of a lot of cryptography on it. Um, what is the Dory reduction? So, this is sort of the analog of the, of the bulletproof red, of the bulletproof reduction. So we start with proof of knowing some V1 and G1 M, V2 and G2 M, uh, such that you know, the, uh, their inner product is C, uh, the commitment to V1 is D1, and the commitment to, D2 is, uh, to V2 is D2. So the first thing that the prover actually is gonna do is they're going to, uh, first thing the prover is actually gonna do is they're gonna send some uh, commitments to the left and right halves of V1 and to the left and right halves of V2 with respect to some new all singing or dancing generators. And the verifier is going to sample some beta. This is formally doing exactly what beta was doing a few slides ago. Um, and the proof is going to update V1 and V2 by adding some multiples of gamma 1 and gamma 2 with, with beta and beta reference. And then once that happened, uh, the proof is going to send a whole bunch of cross terms. Uh, so these, these new modified V1s and V2s, what's their cross product? Cross term between the left parts and the right parts, and verify x and alpha, and now the prover does this folding operation. So v1 get is replaced by alpha times its left half plus its right half, and vice versa for v2. Uh, and what does the verifier have to do? Well, they have to do these slightly messy looking computations in order to update c prime, d1 prime, d2 prime. Uh, you'll notice that you know, d1 l and r, d2 l and r, the commitments that were sent in the first stage, are really only being used to construct new commitments. The, new cross term is constructed entirely from the old cross term, the old commitments, uh, D1, D2, and these, these cross terms, C plus and C minus. Now, this looks a little bit messy. Uh, in some sense it is. When you look at this in detail, you find that there are six GTs being sent in each round. Uh, and if you take this verifier at the end and do usual tricks to defer it out, then there are only nine exponentiations per round. So, at the end of this, there's some claim that the prover knows v1 prime, v2 prime, both of half the length they were before, such that you know c prime, d prime, and uh, c prime is a commitment to the inner products, and d1 and d2 primes are the commitments to the uh, to the half length factors with respect to the new generators. So you'll notice this is exactly lining up with the initial stage of Dory reduced, but with n replaced by m over two. So we can iterate this, uh, and then you know once we get down to n is one, this is something which you have to prove with a slightly irritating, but and essentially straightforward in the protocol. So now that we sort of sketched this out, you know, this is interesting. I mean, this is a, some sort of a inner product argument in, in a sense, but it's not um, generalized in full. Right? We're relying here on V1 and V2 being in G1 and G2. Um, and it's certainly not a problem. So, you know, in the interest of, of, of some time, um, you know, we'll, we'll uh, defer most of this to the paper. Uh, so, you know, 
what do we fundamentally do? Well, we add some public vectors of scalars S1 and S2. So it's basically just adding some more inner products between V1 and S2 and V2 and S1. Um, and actually, we're, we're going to prove a, a full segment of this form. So uh, vectors in G1 and G2 and a vector of scalars and two vectors of scalars just prove everything. Um, for general vectors S1 and S2, there's very little way to do this in less than linear time because you actually have to read these as part of the statement. Um, but for polynomial commitments, it'll turn out that S1 and S2 again have this uh, very explicit product product structure and are very specified by a logarithmic number of values. Um, it's con you, know, you could actually just directly construct a polynomial commitment from this and still get a logarithmic time, but it is convenient to do it with the two tier trick in the same sort of way for higher acts or uh, the one set I'll do. Uh, so here the notion is that you replace the evaluation of f at some point x with some product of a vector on the left and a vector on the right with some matrix M, uh, where these left and right vectors are both of length of x square root of n. That's kind of convenient. Um, and again, like what's convenient about this particular for us is that uh, this directly codes up as one inner product in G1, one inner product in G2, and a cross term, uh, which means that we get half the number of rounds. And sort of in the same way that we're able to batch individual inner products, it turns out you can track that through the entire process. So we can do batching at every possible size. Uh, this is particularly nice because it means that if we uh, finally get to a polynomial commitment, we have some batch of them, uh, the marginal cost of doing one more uh, for the verifier at least is just a one exponentiations and uh, a logarithmic number of field operations. Uh, for the proof of simile, it's a uh, square root n uh, for to, to, to do it. It's basically straightforward. No, so there are various sundry optimizations in this. Um, first, as I mentioned, uh, the argument of public scalars is actually giving two generalized inner products at the same time. Um, and that's convenient. It turns out that you have to do, again, one small extra signal protocol just to uh, be able to transfer from uh, a commitment in G2 through to uh, something that's committing to a vector. But this yes, is basically straightforward. Um, also, as I mentioned you know, way back at the start, uh, we do some optimizations for serialization of GT. Um, for something like the BLS 12381 curve, GT is naively, uh, naively is uh, some element of FP to the 12. So this GT would be you know, 12 scalars to, to encode. Um, it turns out that you can get that down to four scalars by just a little bit of work. Um, and the formula is actually pretty quite nice there, generic of uh, essentially all um, of the standard pairing friendly families. Um, it's also convenient because you're very fast doubling formula, which it's it's good for, I think recollection says it was good for 30 or 40% uh, speed ups on the verifier. And then we do the usual tricks. You're going to batch all your pairs, defer all your exponentiations, you combine every verifier check that has happened with some independent scalars. Um, on the prover side, we do a, a certain amount of work because uh, it will turn out that polynomial commitments in particular, um, this. Sorry, for the yeah, we'll turn out that for, for the polynomial commitments in particular, uh, that um, the substance of the proof of computation uh, is that they have to do uh, many multi exponentiations with respect to the same base points. They have essentially uh, something like n scalars uh, and some vector of length root n, and for each. Uh, for each root n scalars in this, in this thing, they need to multiply by the same, um, same factor. Uh, so what's the, the implementation of this look like? Well, we're based on Blasters, which is a fast frost library for the BLS 12 for 81 curve. Uh, internally, that backs onto some C backend. Um, the baseline that we compared to was the Apollon six that's implicit in Spartan, which is a, a optimized derivative of the scheme in Hyrax based on curve 25519 Dalek, which is a very fast implementation of curve 25519. Uh, to do this, it was about 1600 lines of code blasters to do the torus based serialization of GT and to completely re implement their Peppinger implementation to really support um, these like, very large multi exponentiations. Um, and then it's about another 3400 lines of code to implement the way. So, what's the performance like? Well, in a lot of ways, it's sort of what you would expect. So, uh, the prover, you know, it turns out that the dominant cost is order n operations in G1. Well, in G1, G1 in uh, Blasters in, in BLS 12381 is a bit slower than, uh, than curve 25519 is, but that's essentially a constant factor, as, as we can see. Um, the evaluation proof, the, the size of the evaluation proof, similarly, um, it's 
logarithmic in both cases, the constants are a little bit worse. We're shipping, we're shipping a couple of elements of GT per round, whereas in Spartan, you get to send only two elements of uh, G, which again, is still small because the scale is different. Uh, where things get really interesting, however, is the size of the commitments and the time it takes for the verifier to evaluate the proof. Uh, so the commitment size for us is constant, whereas for something like Hyrax, it goes like square root M. Um, and our verification is logarithmic rather than square root. And so the crossover point here is about uh, 2 to the 22. It depends a little on, on uh, concrete machine performance. Um, and as you can see, the proof evaluations are concretely slower uh, across the board. Uh, but actually, it turns out that you know, at least for large things, you know, two to the twenty, two to the twenty-four, um, this starts to, to disappear. Essentially, the, the linear cost of just evaluating the polynomial once starts to become dominant, um, and the cryptography kind of fades into the background. What's then really interesting for uh, applications is how we behave under batching. So um, here, this is just showing some data with a, a straightforward linear affair. So uh, what is the you know, what are the concrete times. And essentially for a lot of batch sizes, we find that it takes the prover well under a second for n is 2 to the 20 to generate one more proof. This is uh, most of an order of magnitude better than it would be naively. Um, the size of the proof similarly is reduced by about an order of magnitude. Um, and for, uh, for the verifier, um, again, we, we say uh, quite substantially. Uh, so concretely, we end up uh, pushing down close to one millisecond of proof. Uh, which is competitive with some, um, at least in this large batch context, <laughs> it's competitive with things like Roth, um, which require much stronger assumptions. So uh, in very true summary, the like, story seems to be an interesting view in a product argument. Uh, obviously, it can be integrated into other systems to make CK snaps. Um, and that's, that's essentially it. Thank you very much.